Welcome, CPC family, to the Wednesday night Bible study. I'm so glad that you tuned in with us tonight. When I encourage you to rise to your feet wherever you are, we're going to sing a new song. It's all about trusting the Lord and His plan for us. The fact that He made us, He saved us, and He calls us His own. So, let me encourage you as you get used to it. If you haven't heard the song before, just pray your way through the words. Because the lyrics are really rich. And as soon as you can, join your voices with ours and confess this beautiful truth to Him. Here we go. In my mother's womb, you formed me with your hands. Known and loved by you Before I took a breath When I doubted, Lord Remind me I'm wonderfully made You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay And you make all things Work together for my future and for my good you make all things work together for my future and for your name yes. there's a Light just beyond the clouds. Though I walk through the fire, I see clearly now. I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter. I'm a canvas and the clay. Sing it with us, and you make all things. Work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for your name. When in doubt, it, Lord, remind me I'm wonderful. You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay And I know nothing has been wasted No failure or mistakes Cause you're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay You make all things work together for my future and for my good you make all things work together for your glory and for your name you're not finished with me yet you're not finished with me yet or you're not with me yet you're not finished 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 with me yet father god we thank you that we can trust that all things work together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purposes. We gather tonight for your purposes. Open our ears to your word. Open our hearts to your spirit. We're here for you, Lord.
Well, hello. Thank you for being here with us tonight. I'm glad that you're engaging with us in our Wednesday night Bible study. As Shannon said, my name is Joseph Fowler, and um, it's my pleasure to bring you the final talk in our Daniel series. We're in Daniel chapter 12, so at home, if you want to open up your word, uh, your Bible, your app, or whatever you get into the word with, open it up to Daniel 12. We're going to jump right in in just a moment. If I can, let me pray for us, and then we'll, we'll dive into this thing. God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We know that he is above everything, above all things, supreme. He holds all things together. And so right now, help us to find our purpose and our life in Christ. And so as we open up your word, remind us of that. Even though this is Old Testament, help us to catch a glimpse of who you are throughout history, even to now in our lives here presently, imminently with us. So we ask that your Holy Spirit would fill this place, and I ask that you would speak to us through your word, speak through me, just use me tonight. If you would at home, if you would just take a moment and pray that God would open your eyes, that he would teach your mind, that he would touch your heart, and that he would move us, move our wills. And if you would take a moment to just pray for me, as we are in God's word, that I would be helpful to you. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when I was growing up, I played sports, and that's not really an unknown thing around here. But one particular time in high school, I was playing high school football, and that was my sport of choice. I was the best at football out of the big three. We only had three sports. We had Football, baseball, and basketball. That was what we had in my small rural school. And we did have a tennis team for one year. We had a golf team that nobody really knew about or who was on it. Uh, but that was it. We had baseball, football, basketball. And I chose football out of those three to kind of spend the most time with. And anyway, I can remember uh, one particular season we had a coach that he rotated each class through who was going to clean the field house for a given week. And so I can remember the freshmen, I was a sophomore at the time, and I can remember the freshmen's week, the first time that it was their turn to clean the field house, which meant all the, the, the lockers, the locker room, and the bathrooms had to be cleaned by the freshmen. And so they go in there and they come out, and this was, this was always before... Um, like he would always check it after practice for the and tell us how everybody was doing for the next practice. So we would go through and I can remember one particular week, the first week that the freshmen were assigned to clean the field house. Um, our coach comes out and he is very, very angry because the day before the freshmen failed in their attempt to clean the field house. I don't really know what was wrong. He comes out, he's very angry because it wasn't done to his standard. And we're like, okay. And so after practice, we had to stay after practice. And we did what was, I can't remember if he had a name for it or not, but you might remember if you've ever played football before, you might remember there's a thing called up downs. Now in the day, we called them green bays. I'm not really sure why, but it was you pump your feet, and then when a whistle blew, you dropped to your gut and you hit the ground and you popped right back up and kept pumping your feet. There was that, if you've ever watched Remember the Titans, they do a lot of those in Remember the Titans. But even more so than that. So we had to do that drill, but it was coupled with running sprints. So it wasn't just in place, it was running sprints. And every time the whistle blew, we would have to dive, hit the ground and popped right back up and keep running sprints. And we were up and down and up and down. And our practice field wasn't quite 100 yards. This was more like 80 yards. And so we were doing 80-yard sprints. And every time the whistle blew, we were hitting the ground. After a few times up and down the field, we were all exhausted. And the coach blew the final whistle. And he said, if this isn't cleaned again appropriately, it will be worse. You will get double whatever this punishment was. So... Rolls around sophomore's turn to clean the field house. We do an excellent job. Spick and span. Junior's turn to clean the field house. Spick and span. The seniors week came through. Spick and span. And then it came right back around to the freshmen. And everybody reminded the freshmen 
What happened last time? So day one rolls through. It was fine. Day two rolls through, and our coach comes out angry again. And we were like, oh, no. And it was. The sprints and the whistle blows and everything doubled. And I can remember in this moment I was running, and I can remember that we had run so much, and I had hit my stomach so much that my helmet, my face mask, had started digging a little trench in our field where I was just hitting, and my face was scraping the ground. And I can remember thinking, this is awful. This is the worst thing I can imagine at this moment. Little did I know there were other training programs that are much worse than what I was going through at the time. College football players go through worse. Navy SEALs go through 10 times worse. So in the great scheme of things, it wasn't so bad. But in that moment, I thought, I might die here on this field. I thought, this is going to be the moment. What if I hit the ground and I never get back up? My first thought was, will coach even notice? Because he was so angry and blowing the whistle and he was all caught up into punishing us. I was like, if I fall and don't get back up, will anybody even notice or care? Or, if, or will life just go on? And then I thought, maybe this is the end of my football career. I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And push come to shove, I get myself up, I finish the punishment that the freshman had passed on to the rest of us, and I completed that practice and I completed that season and went on to a couple more years of high school football and had a great time doing it. But in the moment, it was so terrible that the thought of quitting happened in my head. And all that ran through my head was all the times my parents or my coaches and people told me, don't quit. And I thought, that's what has to keep me going. I cannot quit. I can't give up here. This is just a moment, and there's a great season in, uh, on the way. Now, I say all that to say this. Daniel finishes up his book in a lot of the same manner that my headspace was in at that practice, in that moment of punishment. Daniel's going to tell us in just a moment, as we jump into Daniel 12, he's going to tell us that life is going to get difficult. In fact, as we get closer to the end times, it's going to get dark and gloomy and scary and horrible. Don't give up. Don't give up because the end is worth all the other stuff we have to go through. So we're in that. And one quick reminder that I want to give you is Daniel 12 is both prophetic and apocalyptic. Not just Daniel 12, but the last half of Daniel that we've been in. You've heard from Ken and Vince and um, Scott and Mark, and you've heard them talk about this apocalyptic literature. And apocalyptic and prophetic scripture, first of all, cannot mean to us what it did not mean to the people that it was written to in the context that it was written. But because there's such a thing as the progressive revelation of God, we are imminently affected by something that was written thousands of years in history. It affects us now, and it affects us going into the future, even though it was written in a time and a place and for a purpose years and years and thousands of years ago. And so I, want you to re I wanted to remind you of that, that in Matthew 24, Jesus tells us, he told his disciples then, and he tells us today, Watch the events spoken through the prophet Daniel, meaning they still have relevance even today, even though they were written in a historical context. That's when we read prophetic and apocalyptic literature in scripture, it has historical context and authorial intent. They were writing for a purpose, but it also has uh, effects for us today. So, and I also want to remind you that when we look at the Old Testament, and it reminds us of the New Testament, there's a fact of every New Testament truth has an Old Testament picture. Every New Testament truth has an Old Testament picture. Daniel and the other Old Testament prophets, they give us a glimpse of God at work in history and for the rest of history. And so uh, it teaches us how to receive a word like revelation. When we get the ultimate apocalyptic scripture, 
in Revelation, we've already had Isaiah and Daniel and all these other prophets that have reminded us of who God is and how he works within the context of history. And so we understand better who God is and how he works when we get a word like Revelation because the Old Testament has already painted a picture, has already illustrated what God is doing and has done. So I want to remind you of that. Revelation has its own historical context, even in Revelation, but all of these scriptures have telescopic interpretation, which means they all have importance to us right now. And, and it will continue to be relevant far into the future until what Daniel calls the end of days. It's all going to be relevant until the end of all things. Something else to remind you about when you're reading a, a specifically apocalyptic literature, which means the end of days type literature like scripture. It's more more than it is a narrative that follows a general chronological order or tells a story. It's more of an, a window that has been opened for us to glimpse a moment in time. So when we open up to Daniel 12, even in the first verse, you're going to see where it says, at this time, in this window, our eyes have been opened to a moment where God is doing something. So it's not going to have a sense of order like we're used to, like if you're watching a movie and there's a beginning and a middle and an end. This is just all one space of time that we're getting to view this moment that Daniel gets a glimpse into because of God. So let's, without further ado, turn to Daniel 12. Let me read to you from verse 1. So in Daniel 12, it says, at, the, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who is in charge of your people. Now, if we can just stop right there for just a moment, let's talk about Michael. Uh, at this moment in time, it's being revealed to Daniel. Daniel is being privy to Michael, the guardian angel of Israel. The reason he's called the prince of Israel, he's, the, he's kind of the, the ruling authority, angelic being over the people of Israel, over the Hebrew people, over Daniel's people, even though they're in exile at this moment. Michael has been assigned to the people. Now, we know of Michael as the guardian angel, the archangel, and he's been assigned to protect and redeem God's people not redemption like salvation redemption, but someone who's going before them to protect them and to help free them from their trouble, their strife, their tribulation. So, back to Daniel 1, uh, Daniel 12, verse 1. It says, Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never been since there was a nation until that time. But at the time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose names shall be found written in the book. So Daniel not only sees that Michael is being made available to the people of Israel, but it's for such a time that there has never been seen before. Such a tragic time that there's never been since any other nation has been around. And the question is like, what is this time? Because this is prophetic literature, it happened within a, within a historical context, but it also had telescopic interpretation it was also prophetic in nature that it was telling about some things that were going to happen so when was this supposed to be was he talking about directly the Babylonian exile and the destruction of the temple there's some of that there for the Jewish people was he talking about the Holocaust because for them there was like never a time like the Holocaust ever in their history the genocide of the Jews that would have been one of their worst moments in the entire in the entire history of Israel the Roman occupation, with, you know, I, we don't know exactly when this might have been talking about, but there have been times of tragedy all the way until we know Revelation reveals more about the Great Tribulation. So we've got all these periods of time where when you're living in them, in the historical context of them, you're like, this is the time, this is the, this is the tragic time that has, there's never been anything like it. Maybe the pandemic, maybe COVID-19, when we all sat back and said, there's never been a time like this in the history of our lives. Well, that might be true, but these times come around. We're going to talk a little bit more about how God works in those moments in just a little bit. But he says, there's ne Michael is coming to be for your people for 
this time. There's never been a time like this in all of history. And then 1B reminds us, you know, the second half of that verse is what is really, really, truly important. In all of these, the hope lies in the grace and the mercy of God. This time that there's never been a time like it, whether it was the whether it was this Babylonian exile or the Roman occupation or the Holocaust or eventually the great tribulation that will happen in Revelation. At that time, your people will be delivered. At that time, your people will be delivered. Everyone who is written in the book. Now, we've seen this book before. The book shows up here. It's shown up in the prophet Isaiah. And it will show up again in Revelation this is the book of life where the people of God are written down. This, this, this is to show that you are sealed for all eternity. If your faith is in Christ, if you are one of the people of God, you are not forgotten, even in times of great tragedy. So Daniel is reminding us here that we are not forgotten. The people of God are not forgotten. In exile, the Israelites were not forgotten. Daniel 12 uh, is going to reveal how harsh the, these times are and how much worse they will get towards what he calls the end of days. But even more so, the entire point, the entire point of Daniel 12 is that we persevere because our hope is not in vain. So let's read a little bit more. Verses 2 through 4. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn away or turn many to righteousness like the stars, uh, like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So the resurrection of the dead, that it literally says all those who are in the dust are going to rise up. And it's not just talking about one segment of people. All the dead are going to be resurrected. And we know that uh, Revelation has sort of revealed sort of what this looks like and what this means. This is for the final judgment of all people. But the resurrection is for all of the dead, saved and unsaved. This is the moment where the final judgment of everyone is going to take place. And the people of God are going to shine like the stars in the universe. And the people that are, uh, are not saved, the people who are not believers, the people who don't have their faith in God, the people who are not God's people that have turned away, they're going to face their eternal condemnation in eternal torment. Those who are the people of God are remembered in the book and they will, be, they will shine like the stars in the universe. The people that are not in the book face eternal torment. At the time of this prophecy, none of this was final. At the time of this prophecy, there had not been a resurrection of the dead. And, there, and, and this was all prophetic talk. This was all, this is going to happen. But it spoke of these final things. And there would still be believers to share the gospel. It says, hey, there's going to be some running to and fro and knowledge will increase. This is believers that are, this is the first glimpse we see of like the gospel, the good news that you can be received into the kingdom of God. You can be grafted in. This is the first glimpse of that good news that we see um, here in Daniel, that this is a hint that Paul would end up calling the great mystery of the gospel is that people of all nations, all tribes, all tongues will be able to receive the word of God and belong to the kingdom of God. And so when it says there's going to be those who are running to and fro, these are the missionaries. These are the believers that are spreading the gospel and knowledge of God is going to increase all over the earth. And there will be a resurrection of the dead. And those who have spread that knowledge, those who have done, uh, those who have placed their faith in Christ and done the work of Christ, they are going to shine. And those who have rejected that message are going to face their condemnation. 
but all are invited into the family of God. And this is a glimpse. Even in the Old Testament, before there was, before there was a cross, before there was a resurrection of Christ, the first resurrected from the dead, before there was any of that, there was this moment where Daniel said, this is going to happen. People from all over the earth are going to be able to have a chance to be a part of this kingdom that will never end, that will never be shaken. So verses 5 through 8. We'll read just a few more verses here and then stop and talk again. It says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, How long shall it be until the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, linen who was above the waters of the stream, he raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time, and then that at the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. I heard, but I did not understand. And then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? So we'll stop right there for just a moment. This imagery gives these two figures on the side of a stream, and then out of nowhere, there's a man hovering above the stream. He is above the waters. He's not in the water. He's not touching the water. He's not on land. He's hovering, and he's clothed in linen. And so uh, typologically, if you ever see a man clothed in linen, uh, a figure that they don't have a name for, but he's clothed in white linen, that's, a, that's typologically, that's Jesus. Jesus is here to deliver a word to Daniel himself. Therefore, Daniel is seeing this vision of angelic beings who are listening for Jesus to speak. And he gives Daniel this final word. Verse 7, Daniel says, how long till the end of these things? And he says, for a time, for times, and half, half a time. And in verse 8, Daniel goes, Huh? <laughs> Jesus starts talking and Daniel doesn't understand. This is how many of us are when God speaks, right? This is how a lot of us are, especially when we aren't quite prepared for what's going to happen. Like you might think you know what God might say to you. Or you might think you know what you're about to read in the next page of scripture. But then when it catches you off guard, sometimes you stumble back and you're like, what? What? What did I just hear? What did I just read? I do not understand what this is. You know, sometimes we aren't quite prepared for what he's about to reveal, either by his word or through his spirit. And we are often left a little bit befuddled. And that's where Daniel was at this, at this moment in verse 8. Daniel sort of left like, okay, I need, to, I need to change the subject a little bit. I need to move on to the next thought because I don't understand what Jesus just said but I, I you know I have more questions like how long is this going to last what it, what am I supposed to look for I have so many questions and verse 9 is where Jesus reminds him this Christ like figure this man clothed in linen reminds him of the most important thing Alistair Begg uh, you've heard Pastor John speak of Alistair Begg several times but he he once said and he was talking about revelation but he was overall talking about apocalyptic scripture he said the main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things so the things that you don't understand the things that are a little bit incomprehensible the things that are a little bit out there that you don't quite understand those aren't necessarily the main things because they're not made plain to us but here, this Christ figure, he says something that's a little odd, something a little bit hard for Daniel to understand, but then he goes back to the plain things. He says, uh, you know, here's the Christ figure reveals the plain thing. Go your way, Daniel. Shut up these words until the end. Now, when he tells Daniel to go his way, he's saying, Daniel, just persevere until the end. Persevere until the end. In fact, Daniel, is in old, he's old in age at this point. He's really telling him, Daniel, you can, you can be at peace 
you can go to the grave at peace right now. Persevere until the end. Stay faithful until the end. Don't worry about these things that we've said that you haven't understood. All will may be made clear in time, but persevere. Stay true to the end. You know, unfortunately, life has to be lived forward, but it can only be understood backward. Life has to be lived forward, but it can only be understood backwards. This is how prophetic scripture works. This is how pro prophecy works in the Bible. All too often we hear it. We don't quite get it. We're a little bit confused by it. And then when we live through it, we can look back and say, Ah, oh, that's what God was doing. That's what God was doing when he said this or that. You know, we know through Daniel that there have been there have been prophecies of Daniel fulfilled, but it took hundreds of years. And it had to wait until Christ came in the flesh and the cross and the resurrection and all of these things were established. And then we look back and we say, oh, that's what Isaiah was talking about. That's what Daniel was talking about. So the plain thing is Daniel doesn't need to worry about what he doesn't understand. And the hovering figure quotes the great theologian Taylor Swift. When he says, haters going to hate, 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 hate. No, he doesn't really say that, but he does say something similar. Let's see, look at verse 10 really quick. In verse 10, he says this. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined. That is, many are going to be saved. But the wicked shall act wickedly. Haters going to hate, 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 hate. And none of the wicked shall understand but those who are wise shall understand. So what happens when the haters hate, 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 hate? You shake it off, right? <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't deep theology here. This is if it's not plain, you just continue to persevere in faith. And so Daniel, he understands there's going to be people that make confessions for the Lord. They're going to place their faith in the Lord. They're going to um, be held upright in God's eyes and then there's going to be those who are acting wickedly and they're going to continue to act wickedly they're going to reject God they're not going to be his people but in let's finish up the chapter and we'll finish up just a few thoughts in 11 through 15 he says and this is sort of just all rolled into one thought he says and from that time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes the desolate is set up there shall be 1290 days Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. But go your way until the end, and you shall rest and stay, and you shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. Let me just finish up by saying this. We said in the beginning that apocalyptic scripture cannot mean to us what it did not mean to them uh, to whom it was written. Forsake the argument that it was written to us because all scripture is God-breathed and useful. We know that. These numbers of days mean something. They would have referenced something chronological for the people that it was written to in order that, something, that it should mean something historically speaking. The temple desecration of Jeru in Jerusalem would go on to last for 1,290 days. And they add the extra time. Again, it says, blessed is the person who uh, perseveres until 1,335 days. He adds 45 more days to connote this idea of perseverance. Make it past the desolation of the temple. Make it through that. Even a few more days after that, be persevering in your faith. The faithful need only to persevere for a little while longer, and their relief and peace will come. Joy will be restored. This is the ultimate message of Daniel in this final chapter. The days will be dark. History will continue to repeat itself. Let me tell you, there will always be terrible rulers who make life terrible for the, the people of God. It's going to be dark, and it's going to be scary, and it's going to be horrible as we approach the end of days. Life is going to be difficult. There are going to be horrible things that happen in life until the end of days. Our faith guarantees that which we hope for ultimately will be glorified with God 
Maybe you feel like you're in a horrible season of life right now. Maybe you feel like things are dark and scary for you, even in this moment, in this season of life. Not worrying about the end of days, not worrying about what happened in Daniel's time, but right now things are pretty bad for you in your life. We have a Savior in Jesus, and he has said that it is only for a season that we might suffer. But our faith in him means that we ultimately have salvation in him, that he is the Prince of Peace, he is the Lord of Lords, and he will write us in the book, and that we will be, just as Daniel was told in that last line, you will take your place at the end of days. If you flip over and read a little bit of Revelation, you see what place he's talking about. We are seated at the throne of God. And we get to celebrate at the end of days. Because all things will be made new and made holy and made glorious. And we get to enjoy that with our Creator and our God. So the message of Daniel 12 is to keep going until the end and be blessed. Will you place your faith in Jesus today? Our faith that secures our hope that is glory in Christ. If that is a, is, if that is a question on your mind or something that you have, that you've thought about, hey, I don't know where I am in this faith journey. In these moments, knowing what we know from Daniel and knowing that it continues on through Revelation and beyond, that even now, what we read in the Old Testament is a picture of what will happen now and what will happen in the future, that things will be terrible, but for the people of God, perseverance means that we come out on the other side blessed and glorious. So will you in this moment place your faith in the only one who can give peace in the midst of all of that? If that's something that's on your mind, please contact, please contact us at cpcfamily.org or Text us, text connect to 256-772-4463. Please let a pastor here at Cross Point know that you would love to talk more about your faith, placing your faith in Jesus, what salvation means, and what the next step is after that. If you would allow me, let me pray for us, and we'll, we'll be done for the night. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for your word. I thank you that you show up even in the Old Testament to remind us that things might be tough, but if we just persevere, if we just go on our way, we will be blessed by you, God. To stay faithful in the midst of trial, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of horrible circumstances, God, we are reminded that you are glorious above all things and that you have our best interest in mind, that you give us purpose in our pain, that you give us a hope for our future. I pray for everyone who sees this and views this and listens, God, that, that their hope will rest in Jesus Christ. And for those who are wrestling with faith right now, I pray that you'll penetrate their hearts, that your Holy Spirit will reveal you to them, and that they will receive salvation that only comes through Christ alone. In Jesus' name, amen.